Howdy partners, we're back in the Guadalupe Mountains to talk about what happens to carbonate and REMS attached to continents but deposited under arid conditions. I'm standing here at the beginning of the Permian Reef Trail. This is a very famous um, trail in the, in the Guadalupe Mountain. I used to take students there for teaching because um, it shows some really clear evidence of all the different facies that you can find in this uh, Permian system. And it also contains evidence that this was a very arid um, climate when, when the uh, rocks were deposited. So in the Permian, in the late Permian, we had still the supercontinent Pangaea uh, and the uh, ocean surrounding Pangaea is known as the Pentalassic Ocean and our location was really on the western margin of Pangaea of that supercontinent, I'll indicate it here with a star, and it was a shallow water uh, location and in this particular location we had subsidence, subsidence going on so we had tectonic subsidence going on and the formation of three mini basin the Midland Basin which is currently in a subsurface where you find all the oil and gas the Delaware Basin which is partially in the subsurface but also partially exposed in fact I'm standing on the edge here of the Delaware Basin um, where you know at the outcrop and we also had the Oro Grande Basin in Mexico, which is not shown on this uh, picture. The point I want to make is that there's a lot of oil in these Permian rocks. In fact, it's the Permian Basin of Texas. It's one of the oldest oil plays in the world where a, a fortune was made. And we're going to try to understand why this is the case, because it is a carbonate system. So let's look theoretically first uh, on this block diagram to what happens to carbonates when they are exposed during low stand but in arid condition. And that's a stark difference between what we saw previously and what happened in arid condition. The main difference, of course, is that during low stand, you typically have eolian dunes migrating on top of the exposed carbonates. The sand, the classic sand, is a good evidence for arid conditions. But when you say arid condition, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is no water. In fact, we have evidence for some water, maybe seasonal water, maybe, maybe during the wet season you had more rainfall, because if you look at the interdune area, we see karstification. Minor karstification, but karstification is present in the system as well. And this is like a, a nice um, karst filled with silt and some debris of, of the uh, surrounding limestone. Now, during the transgressive system track, you have all the sands on the shelf that are basically being reworked. So you have a, a, a very classic rich shelf and you have evidence for grain shoal on the edge of the system and potentially reefs. And of course, you can still have mass transport deposits. And in the Permian Basin, you have really good evidence for those shelf sand. Here is a picture, this is literally a few meters behind me, you can see that we have something interesting happening. We have the gray rock at the bottom, that's a limestone, that's the Permian limestone. We have a clear surface, that's a sequence stratigraphic surface. In fact, this is a sequence boundary. This is the this evidence for um, dissolution. If you looked closely at the surface, you would see also a desert varnish, so evidence that this was exposed to, to a desert. And then above the surface, so above the, uh, the pen here, what you see is this more reddish brown lithology. And this is actually an interesting lithology because it's a sandstone. It's a very fine, well-sorted sandstone. It's pitted, it's well-sorted, it's small. It's clearly an Eolian sandstone. But what's strange is that this Eolian sandstone contains carbonate grains, contains marine organisms as well. So it's a mix of an Eolian sand and some marine carbonate. So what is it? Well, effectively, it's the transgressive tract. And the transgressive tract here, in this case, is made up of 
the low stand track sands, Eolian sand, that were mixed with carbonates during the transgression. So you completely rework the low stand, which was the sands, and you make it into the new transgressive system track. So the surface we're looking at really is both the sequence boundary and the transgressive surface. So um, how does that relate now to the Permian Basin and what's the important concept here? Well, the important concept is that during low stand, what we tend to have is migration of clastic on top of the platform. And this clastic is dumped or shunted into the basin. That's what we saw previously. We saw those thick sands in the basin that form good reservoirs. Those are low stand sand. And on top we have the, of the platform, we have the dunes. Now comes the transgression. We rework those sands, and you've seen a, a, a picture of those sands before. And then during the high stand, we deposit more of the carbonates. So then during the, the high stand, we tend to be dominated by carbonates on the shelf. And because during high stand, carbonate production is maximum, those carbonates are also exported to the basin. Whereas during low stand, we tend to be dominated by clastic on both the shelf and the basin. And this is really characteristic for carbonate system in arid environments. And it's known as reciprocal sedimentation. Reciprocal because you have carbonates in high stand, both on the shelf and the basin, but you have clastic during low stand, both on the shelf and basin. That's the reciprocal part of this equation. Now during high stand, because we're in arid condition, Typically what we have is saline mudflat at the base of that system and salinas, so very saline um, lagoon if you want. That's not really a system where you form a lot of tidal uh, flats, contrary to the wet system, but you tend to have those salinas. And if you look at those salinas close from shore, here's an example again from the Permian Basin, you can ac actually have the position of evaporitic minerals. In this case, we see here, it's a combination uh, of um, gypsum and halide, but mostly dominated by gypsum. And you also have in that gypsum, some clastic silt. So it's a mix of classic silt, gypsum, and a little bit of, of uh, halide in the system. And that's very characteristic for the back of the depositional system of the uh, Permian Basin carbonates. If you go a little bit closer, a little bit more into the open lagoon, you have evidence for high salinities because despite the fact that you don't have necessarily the position of evaporitic minerals, you see that the stromatolite grow here. This is stromatolitic limestone. Now to grow stromatolite, you need to avoid grazing by um, other organisms, notably by gastropods. And gastropods don't do well in high salinity. So that's why in modern environments like Shark Bay, you tend to have stromatolites when you don't have grazers, when you have high salinity. So again, in the Permian Basin, we have evidence for high salinity in the, the saline lake, the salinas. They're not lake, they're actually marine system, but in the salinas, because we see the deposition of those stromatoly stromatolytic limestones. And as we get closer to the open ocean, the lagoon becomes less saline. We are more in an open ocean and we start to have just muddy deposits with evidence for, again, uh, the position of, of open marine uh, fa fauna, like in this case, this large gastropod. 